Saludos amigos, en esta segunda parte del documental La magia de Salomón, realizado por Polk Runion, se enfoca en el uso del espéculum o espejo negro para invocar o ev y evocar a los espíritus. Sé que este es un sistema complicado, no tan fácil como el NAP, pero está claro que Jehov tomó parte del emejetón para la realización del milagro del nuevo poder avatar. Pop Runio le pone su marca personal, realizando ciertas modificaciones al sistema, tanto del emejetón como del sistema de Almadel. En esta parte del documental explica qué hacer para que el uso del espéculum sea eficaz, utilizando velas, iluminándolo para que las formas comiencen a aparecer y para que se dé esa conexión con los espíritus que se están invocando. Hace referencia también al pasaje de la Biblia que dice que Dios hizo al ser humano a su imagen y semejanza, indicando que lo que aparece es nuestro verdadero yo, nuestro yo Dios, que se conecta con estos seres místicos y es lo que se logra ver junto con una canalización en donde se da las respuestas a nuestras preguntas. También hace una advertencia que estas prácticas no son un juego, y que si se realizan, tienen que ser con entera responsabilidad y respeto. En lo personal, no he realizado estas prácticas, pero lo haré y en el siguiente video les traeré mi experiencia. Tengo que decirles que hay una parte del video que se corta. Es una falla, no encontré otro que esté completo y con subtítulos, pero aún así es entendible. Bueno amigos, sin más que decirles, espero que disfruten y sobre todo que les sea útil e informativo este documental. Un abrazo fraternal y hasta el próximo video. And yet the final secret of how to employ these magical aids was always missing. With all the atmosphere, the philosophy, the paraphernalia, the powerful conjurations, and the hypnotic effects, a spontaneous vision in the crystal or in the dark mirror always depended upon some special psychic ability. One had to be a natural medium. And for all my toxic fever dreams and my hypnotic experiments, I had certainly become a mystic, but not a clairvoyant. And yet there had to be a way, a way that anybody with the desire and the determination could summon these spirits to visible appearance and have conversation with them. I tried placing a crystal ball in the triangle, but then when I stepped back inside the magic circle, as the operator was supposed to do according to the ancient texts, the 60 millimeter ball appeared the size of a doorknob. Therefore, I knew that the crystal had to be used inside the circle for the invocation of the angels. And yet, we had to put something in that triangle. Something fascinating, something hypnotic, and something large enough to provide a viewing surface. Yes, the speculum, the dark mirror, and what better entrance into those caverns measured man the poet Coleridge had envisioned in his mystic eye. It had to be the dark mirror. But how to use it, how to make it actually work, I asked myself. And then something that I had read the year before jogged my memory. Something about the use of dark mirrors in the Far East. The final clue had been sitting on my bookshelf all the time. The book was called Tantra, the Yoga of Sex by Omar Garrison. In this work, The author described an ancient oriental method of invoking the images of previous incarnations from the reflection of one's own face in a dark mirror, flanked by candles. As I reread this section in Garrison's book, I felt a shiver of excitement. 
I was experiencing the same thrill that an archaeologist must feel as he brushes away the sand and looks down at the unbroken seal of an ancient royal tomb. I tried Garrison's experiment, and I found that it worked with remarkable effectiveness. If one stares in a darkened room into a mirror flanked by candles, after several minutes, a strange phenomenon will almost always occur. The familiar reflection will fade out, the mirror will go black, and then when the image returns, it will be the face of someone or something else. This is any concept of reincarnation. It probably went back as far as the Paleolithic, when Stone Age people stared fascinated at their reflections in dark, still pools of water, seeing the strange transformation occur and being convinced that they were in the presence of their gods. I suspected that in a ritual setting using traditional conjurations and symbols, Specific spirits, and even ancient gods and goddesses, might be summoned from the other side. This might well be the hidden meaning behind that strange passage in the Bible that reads, God fashioned man in his own image. I command the experience is usually accompanied by a profound sense of an otherworldly presence. It was obvious that this phenomenon must have been discovered a long time before Here by the Tetragrammaton. Oh, by which the elements are overturned, the air is sundered, the fire is generated, the earth moves, the sea rolls back, and all those two things celestial of things terrestrial, of things infernal, do tremble and are confounded together. Come, appear before this circle, within that triangle, in fair and human form, without horror or deformity and without delay. Come from whatever part of the world thou art and answer my questions. Come presently, come visibly, come affably and manifest that which I desire. Being summoned by the true and living God, Iliorum, I command thee by the particular king who rules over thee, the mighty Amaman, and by the power of the archangel, Raphael, I command thee, appear before me, don't speak unto me in a clear, intelligible voice in my mother tongue, free from ambiguity and guile. Come in the name of Adonai Zebaoth. Come, why dost thou tarry? Adonai Jedi, King of Kings, commands thee. I've not been dead, but only sleeping, hardly longer than a wink. I'll be up and rolling thunder once I have another drink. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> After this discovery, the use of the magic mirror in an elevated triangle seemed obvious. This 17th century Lamegaton manuscript clearly shows a large, black-filled circle in the center of Solomon's triangle. Notice that the instructions written around the triangle say two foot off from the circle and three foot over, not three foot across as the published version has it. 
The triangle was intended to be raised up to eye level. And this drawing, from a 16th century manuscript by the mysterious Dr. Thomas Rudd, shows a mirror on a stand with Solomon's secret seal from the Goetia of the Lamegaton clearly depicted on the reverse side, exactly like my original setup. We know that polished obsidian mirrors were used in the Neolithic Middle Eastern city of Katal Hayuk as far back as 9,000 years ago, before the Great Flood. And later, in the time of Solomon, the Egyptians and the Canaanites made mirrors of polished copper and of silver, metals attributed to the planet Venus and the moon. I extended my experiments to include others, and I soon discovered that it was even more effective if the magician stood behind a passive receiver who could then concentrate totally on the mirror. Under the power of the archangel Uriel, through the angel Mendiel, in the realm of the king Zimanar, And thee by Barlamensis, Alicienses, Almancia, Apollo Rosin. I am here. What do you desire of me? And so I had the secret. Like Dr. Frankenstein, I had learned how to do it. But even though I may have been as obsessed as the fictional Dr. Frankenstein, I didn't want to make his mistake. Before I opened the brass vessel and released these spirits into the world again, I wanted to fully understand the philosophical and spiritual significance of a system that had been such a closely guarded secret for so many thousands of years. I had to ask myself, was it possible that there might be slumbering demons in our past that, as the late Howard Phillips Lovecraft had suggested, might better be left unawakened? How had the beautiful goddess Astarte and her handsome consort, Prince Baal the Thunder God, been transformed into demons in the medieval forbidden books of black magic. I found the answers to these questions in the mysterious, long-lost biblical book of Enoch. In those mythical prehistoric times before the great flood, the book of Enoch tells of a war in heaven in which God and his loyal host of angels led by the archangel Michael, were arrayed against a horde of rebellious angels who had lusted after the daughters of men and had descended to earth, where they were breeding a race of giants and were teaching humans the forbidden secrets of sorcery and magic. The Book of Enoch goes on to relate that the four great archangels, Mikael, Raphael, Gabriel, and Oriel, came down and imprisoned these fallen angels at the four corners of the earth, where they became known as the Watchers. Jewish, Christian, and Islamic theologies retained the traditional loyal angels of heaven, especially those four great beings who rule the quarters of the universe, Raphael, Mikael, Gabriel, and Oriel. But they had no place for the gods and goddesses of the ancient pagan religions they had conquered. And so the rabbis, the priests, and the imams practiced a sleight of hand trick and reclassified the homeless but not forgotten pagan deities as those same fallen angels who were already chained in deep pits at the ends of the earth. Thus, their greatest rival, the Canaanite thunder god, Prince Baal, became the demon Baal first among the ranks of the fallen, who was said to appear as a cat, a toad, or a man, or all three at once, and to grant the power of 
invisibility. Prince Baal's beautiful consort, the goddess Astarte, queen of heaven, and mistress of the temple of love, was transformed into the demon Astaroth, described as a hurtful angel with bad breath, but who, when summoned, would reveal the true history of the fallen angels. And she certainly has fulfilled that promise. This prehistoric myth of the fallen angels laid the foundation for a Middle Eastern legend about the biblical King Solomon, who was said to have been the greatest magician of ancient times. According to our legend, Solomon, armed with the power of God's holy angels, bound and sealed those seventy-two rebellious spirits, or genie, into the brass vessel, from which he called them forth to do his bidding, even to assist him in building the great and holy temple at Jerusalem. But can our fantastic legend have any truth behind it? Are we really seeing these ancient gods and goddesses who became the fallen angels in the dark mirror in our magic triangle? Are the strange voices that speak through our lips during the magical channeling process really coming from these deities and demons of the dim past? Have we actually opened that lost portal between the worlds. And if so, can these powerful genie be commanded to reveal hidden knowledge and accomplish wonderful things? Well, the only way you're going to know for certain is to look into the dark mirror yourself. But I warn you, unless you take Solomon's magic very seriously, you should have nothing to do with these experiments. This ancient art is not a party game or a Halloween prank. There is no place in the magic circle for the dabbler or the thrill seeker. Every aspect of this system, spiritual, psychological, and technical, must be thoroughly understood before these experiments are undertaken. Like knights of olden times, magicians must be trained armed and armored before they go on a quest into the spirit realm. First you should know that the magic circle is your philosophical fortress when you open the gateway between the worlds. It represents the perfect circle of the vast universe and the unbroken boundary of your own being, which are one and the same when you practice Solomon's art. As above, so below. As within, so without. You should know that even back in ancient times, the triangle represented the philosophical first plane of manifestation. It acts as a cage containing and restraining the spirits you evoke. For the moment, let us imagine that we are participating in the original act of creation, back at the dawn of time, out in the vast reaches of cosmic space. First, we will create just one point. Next, we, or God, will establish a second point and connect it to the first so that we have a line. Then, when we plot our third point, we have our triangle, the first flat surface. Now, when we create point four, we have the first solid. We have created a thing. And, as long as we refrain from establishing point five, setting our thing in motion, we will constrain our creation to remain in its position. We will keep our spirit within the triangle. Traditionally, the name of the Archangel Michael, the Angel of Power, was separated into three syllables, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, and written in the corners of the triangle to add a visual emphasis to the symbolic geometry that bound the spirit. You must understand this concept thoroughly before you open Solomon's brass vessel and release the genie. It matters not whether you are a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, or even a pagan. These archangels are very much a part of our Western tradition. They represent the positive forces that drive the engine of the universe and the love that holds it all together. 
In the order of the Temple of Astarte, we conceive and visualize them as complementary male and female beings. For angels can appear in any form they wish, or any suitable form that your imagination can provide for them. They activate your magic circle of protection. Casting your circle with a pentagram ritual before each operation is certainly important, but that alone is not enough. The great archangels must live in your mind and in your heart. You must have them inside as well as outside. Noske te ipsum en tuo templo tu es deus. This is the very first time we have ever permitted cameras into the inner sanctum of the Order of the Temple of Astarte. Notice the names of the great archangels of the quarters in Phoenician around the magic circle. You will hear these same names invoked in the traditional pentagram ritual that precedes and follows every magical operation. But I say again, the pentagram ritual by itself is not enough. You have to have these four great archangels of the quarters indwelling within you and ready to help you control the rebellious spirits. Otherwise, opening the brass vessel would be like opening Pandora's box, which, according to the ancient Greek myth, released evil into the world and then could not be reclosed. Therefore, you must first master the art of angelic invocation before you proceed to its darker counterpart, the evocation of Solomon's 72 spirits. Along with the secret of the mirror in the triangle, the other crucially important element missing from the Galatia was the fact that the 72 spirits of the brass vessel had 72 direct counterparts in the holy angels of the Shemham Farash, or extended name of God. Now these derived or suffix angels are not as personified as the archangels of the quarters or the angels of the planetary spheres, but they do provide a direct channel of power through which the four archangels of the quarters control each and every one of the spirits of the brass vessel. Unless this concept is understood and integrated into your goetic operations, you are on spiritually dangerous ground. These Shemham Farash angels even have their own sigils, and there is a short invocation for each one of them. The careful operator should use both. And before anyone in the order of the Temple of Astarte is allowed to participate in goetic operations, we insist that they experience a series of four archangelic invocations. So how do we invoke the archangels? Well, there's another book in the Lamegaton Compendium that probably should have been published with the Goetia. It's called the Almadel of Solomon and gives us a very effective method for invoking, and by that I mean calling down the angels. The original Almadel was a tabletop device made entirely of wax. This was an ingenious design. The square slab of wax had holes at each corner through which the four candles were inserted, leaving enough length below to raise the little platform high enough so that a small incense burner could be placed beneath it. From where the incense fumes could rise through another set of holes, to envelop the crystal shoe stone in mysterious tendrils of fragrant smoke, thus adding to the hypnotic effect. As with the Goetia, the secrets of the Almadel were not clearly explained in the Lamegaton. 
I had to use equal measures of scholarship and inspiration to reconstruct and fine-tune the system. But the effort was certainly worth the trouble because the Almadel angels control the Goetia spirits. I know that statement may be surprising to some magical scholars who never look beyond, uh, to quote Cornelius Agrippa again, what is writ in the bare letters. The Almadel's angels are not arranged in an ascending hierarchy. They are attributed to the four quarters and the twelve signs of the zodiac, with each of the four quarters governing the three astrological signs particular to its nature. In other words, the signs of air, fire, water, and earth, which we know are governed by the four great archangels of the quarters, Raphael, Mikael, Gabriel, and Oriel. Realizing this, we can simply disregard the late 17th century hodgepodge of garbled angelic names the Lamegaton's scribe has attributed to these altitudes, and thus restore the Almadel system to its full power and purpose, as shown here in our Master Mandala. Each of the four great archangels of the quarters empower three sets of six Shemham Farash angels who in turn control three sets of six counterpart Goetia spirits, which are distributed, two to each of the 36 decans, or 10 degree divisions of an astrological sign. This occurs in similar order all around the zodiac. If you find this confusing at first glance, you can study the Master Mandala in the companion book to this video, the Book of Solomon's Magic. The design may appear complicated, but it is actually quite simple and easy to work with. You will note that our modern Almadel is combined with the traditional double cube altar. We have shielded the candles at the four corners, and an incense chamber below has been added, with slots cut around the central compass rose to allow the rising smoke to surround our crystal shoe stone, which is placed on our master mandala that unifies the Goetia and Almadel systems in one all-encompassing design. Notice that we've placed low stools around the foot of the altar so that four or more people may sit and gaze up at the smoke-shrouded crystal haloed in spectral light with nothing else in their field of vision. Now, let's see how this works in actual practice. 